Hey guys, this is Sean. As the first video is a part of this series, we're going to be covering how to solve Laplace's equation on a rectangle. Um, in accordance with this series, we're going to be covering several types of videos in which we cover these various types of shape problems, as I like to call them. So, look forward to seeing Laplace on a circle, cylinder, sphere, and then outside the circle, blah 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 blah. We could go on and on. But let's get started on this problem. So this may be your first first time ever seeing one of these Laplace on a rectangle questions, or Laplace on any 2D shape problems. And the first thing you want to do is essentially identify the shape that we're going off. So, as may have, you may have noticed from the title video, we're going to be covering Laplace's equation inside a rectangle. Step zero to solving these problems, right, is to draw the shape. Okay, so let's do that. So we're told that we're going to be modeling inside a rectangle within the bounds 0 to L and then 0 to H, okay? So we're going to be in the positive quadrant, so the first quadrant, X, Y, and then let's draw a rectangle, okay? Rob the rectangle, okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to label our boundary conditions, okay? So we're given two se se sets of boundary conditions right here. This set, and then this set, okay? So let's just go around each um, side of the rectangle and label each one. So at this bottom one right here, we're told that z is x0 is equal to z0. So for any x at height 0, we're equal to 0. And then on the opposite side, uxh is equal to f of x. Let's tackle this side now, okay? Here we're told that the first derivative of u with respect to x, y, ly is equal to zero, and then the opposite side equal to zero. And then Laplace equals zero, okay? So now what we're gonna do, step one is separate variables okay so here we're given Laplace's equation okay and what we're going to do is we're going to define two new variables so let u x y be equal to the product of f of x times g of y okay and remember that the Laplace on a rectangle or on Cartesian coordinates is just going to look like this So what we're going to do now is we're going to substitute in the def what we have defined as u, x, y into the Laplacian, okay? And what we find here is that if we do the appropriate plugs, remember that g is not a function of x. So if we remember from multivariable calculus, we can just treat that as a constant, essentially. Whereas on the other side, we have to treat f as the constant And now let's move on. Let's separate the terms across the equal sign and then divide both sides by gf. So then what we get is this relationship. So now we can check if we separate variables successfully. On this side, all x dependence, and on this side, all y dependence. So variables have been separated. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to define our separation constant. So we know that these two values have to be equal to some some constant. But do we define the separation constant as positive or negative? And that's what we're going to figure out right now. So <clears throat> in order to determine the sign of the separate determine the sign of the separation constant What we're going to do is we're going to look at the boundary conditions. Okay. So let's take a look here. So in the y direction, right? In the y direction, we have non-homogeneous BCs. Okay. 
in the x direction, so the two derivative boundary conditions, we have homogeneous species. Okay, so therefore, in the x dir, we want oscillatory solutions. Whereas here, in the wider, we want exponentials. Okay. For more details on how to determine oscillatory versus exponential, I will make a future video covering this specific idea, so look forward to that. But this concept of determining the sign of the separation constant um, definitely comes with time in practice. So it's not something that will come immediately, I don't think, but it definitely took me a few tries. Okay, So going back to our problem now, where we have separated variables, remember that we want, um, in the x-direction, we want oscillatory solutions. And based on our, our separation variables right now, our, sep our differential equation, we want to define our separation constant as a negative. And the reason for this is that in the highlighted right here, in our differential equation for f or uh, for x right here, we're going to have solutions in sine and cosine, which are oscillatory. And then that pretty much completes the job. Okay. All right. So step two here is to solve the diff um, the separated differential equations. Okay. So the first one we're going to tackle is the f, um, f of x ones, right? So our differential equation for f looks like this. Okay. And then if we solve that differential equation appropriately, what we should find is that f of x is equal to c1 sine square root lambda x plus c2 cosine square root lambda x. And these sine and cosines come from the fact that our solution for a second order homogeneous differential equation um, can be written as a linear combination of exponentials, and then we can rewrite those exponentials in regards to their um, sine and cosine forms, right? So, yeah, if you do some plug and chug there, you should eventually come out to the sine and cosine forms. Not too challenging, hopefully, but I believe there was a homework question on this once in a while that comes up frequently, just to show you guys like where the idea is. But anyways, let's continue on. So a boundary condition tells us to take the first derivative of f. Okay. And if we do that, what we find is that our diff our equation obviously changes quite a bit. I should put that lambda over here. Sorry, I forgot to mention. So remember that lambda, right, is a number, a constant, right? So lambda could be greater than zero, equal to zero, or less than zero. Okay? And what we're doing right now is that in this part of the problem right here, we're assuming that lambda is going to be greater than zero, and this will come to light sooner or later. So if we plug in the boundary condition of zero, which is equal to zero, right? What we find is that um, sine of zero, sine of zero is obviously zero. So sine of so and cosine of zero is one. So we get this relationship right here. As defined earlier, right? This lambda right here is greater than zero, and if c1 equals 0, then trivial solution. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Ignore that. Ignore that. I'm sorry. Okay. Since lambda is greater than 0, c1 must be 0 to satisfy that relationship. Okay. So therefore, c1 is equal to 0. Okay. So this makes evaluating the boundary condition, the other one, a little bit easier. I believe we're evaluating at L, right? Okay. So at L, we're told that we're equal to negative C2 square root lambda sine square root lambda L. Okay, so lambda once again, lambda greater than, greater than zero. Okay, but if C2 equal to zero, then f of x is trivial. Right, because that just tells us that f of x is equal to zero, which doesn't really help. So consequently, we want our sine to be zero. Sine is sometimes zero. 
which is much, much more helpful, right? And we know that the zeros of sine follow some nice pattern, right? For any random integer n, we're going to have a, periodic well, sorry, a periodicity n where sine is going to become zero. And if we solve for lambda, what we find is that lambda is equal to n pi over l, right? And then if we're counting for all integer cases of lambda greater than zero, right, n can be equal to 1, 2, to infinity. And this is our lambda. Consequently, our f of x simply becomes, our original f of x, sorry, um, becomes equal to c2 cosine n pi over l x. Cool. So we have solved for f of x. So now let's solve for g of y. Okay. Oh, before we do that, sorry. We better case for lambda equal to 0 now. So for lambda equal to 0, we have the differential equation df dx squared is equal to 0. And then taking the integral of both sides twice, what we find is that f of x for 0 is equal to c1x plus c2. Okay, So if you take the first derivative of this, what we get is that we're just simply equal to c1. And then evaluate in boundary condition, c1 must be equal to 0. Okay, But then the other boundary condition doesn't tell us much either, right? So applying these two boundary conditions together, what we find is that f of x for lambda equal to zero, right? Lambda equal to zero is just equal to c2. So consequently, lambda equals zero is not trivial. And therefore, lambda equals zero exists, okay? We could do lambda less than zero, but I'll leave that as a exercise for you guys. Um, the reason being is that lambda equals less than zero actually just turns out to be non-existent in this set. Okay, and the reason why is that there's a contradiction along the way. So I believe this is a common homework problem, so I'm not going to answer it, guys, for now, so that you guys can figure out your homework, but solutions for this question are on my website, so please feel free to check that out. Okay, so now let's check out similar case for g of y. All right, so d squared d g y squared is equal to lambda g, right? And then for lambda greater than zero, okay, we have solutions in g of y, which are equal to um, cinch and cosh, hyperbolic sine cosine, okay? And then we're told that at zero, we're equal to zero. And this is a really nice diagram or like graph to get like, memorized. But cinch function looks a little bit like this. Whereas cosh looks a little bit like that for like one. Okay, so this this little graph right here tells us that at zero, cinch equals zero, cosh equals one. So then this plug in chugging tells us that C4 must be equal to zero. And then g of y, c3, cinch. That's for lambda greater than zero. And then if we go through and check for lambda equals zero, g of y, similar, similar to above, is simply equal to c5y plus c6. Um, where g of 0 is equal to 0, so c6 is equal to 0. And then evaluating the other boundary condition um, checks out because we don't know what f of x is, right? We don't know this function f of x is, so therefore lambda equals 0 must also exist, which basically doubly confirms from earlier. Okay, so now step, uh, sorry, step 3 in this process put everything together. So what we're going to do is, from earlier, we defined u as the product of g times f, right? So we're going to take a, a superposition of them, of n equals 0 to infinity, where a of n, I'll, I'll elaborate on this a little bit more, where a of n is essentially our constants um, 
C1, uh, sorry, C2 and C3 multiply by each other. So cosine n pi L x times oops, cinch n pi L y. Okay. So the reason why I call this a n, right, is because it's just an arbitrary coefficient, right? Why bother keeping track of many coefficients when you can just combine them all together and call them one arbitrary coefficient? Much easier to work with. And then the reason for this summation is that we're taking a linear combination of solutions. And if you remember from linear algebra, a linear combination is still a solution to the original problem. So this works out. So now what we're going to do now is apply the IC or initial condition. Well, in this case, the non-homogeneous boundary condition, which is u of x h is equal to f of x. Okay. So let's do that. So u of x h is equal to summation n to infinity of a n cosine n pi l x times cinch n pi over l h. Okay. And in another video, I will cover more about the orthogonality principle used here. Right, but if we solve for a n, right, which is equal to f of x, um, the orthogonality steps are very, very important for the entirety of linear algebra. Uh, sorry, in the entirety of partial diffeq's, but there's a lot of steps to understand what's happening here to how I got to this solution for the coefficient. So, highly recommend you guys watch that video because it will help you understand it. Hopefully, what we find is our final solution simply looks something like this for our coefficient, okay? <clears throat> so then, the final solution is simply this equation right here, which I'm going to box in green, right? With the coefficient a n. defined below. Okay, So that's how you solve Laplace's equation on a rectangle. And I will be uploading the notes for this video on my website as well, and the link will be in the description. Please let me know if you guys have any comments, questions, or concerns, and I look forward to um, well, making the next video, I guess.